So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wheeler Centre and this evening's discussion on art and feminism. My name is Jane Montgomery Griffiths, and I'm an actor and writer, and when I'm not doing that, I'm the director for the Centre for Theatre and Performance at Monash University. So I suppose my main credentials for chairing this panel tonight are the fact that I spend a lot of my time trying to corrupt young minds to understand the nebulous, amorphous, brain-itching confusion that is art and feminism, um, often coming to the conclusion that there is no conclusion in terms of the definition of this. But I'm sanguine, I'm optimistic that tonight, with this eminent panel of experts, we might well get to the core of some of these nitty-gritty questions what is art, what is feminism, and indeed, does it matter? Well, I think it probably does. Um, but without further ado, I'll introduce you to our panel. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Emily Floyd. Um, Emily is uh, uh, an artist practitioner, has done some wonderful work with different textures, working with texts in terms of installations, also, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, an academic at Monash, and so I think that's something that I'd like to touch on in terms of what are the synergies between identifying oneself as an artist, as a feminist, and also as an educator. So would you join me, please, in welcoming Emily? Then we have Atlanta Eek, a fantastic dancer who has recently won the inaugural Kia Choreography Award, known for her extraordinarily visceral, uh, dare I say grotesque performances, which investigate and interrogate the female body in all of its wondrousness and monstrosity. Atlanta Eek. Then we have Mish Grigor, who is one of the, the what we should say, triumulariat of the Sydney enfant terrible of post-dramatic art. Post. Um, and I don't know, it feels, it feels slightly un-Melbourneian that we have a Sydney cider here in terms of, you know, being the feminist avant-garde. We could have had the rabble, but nah, we decided to go for post instead. Last time I saw Misha, she was humiliating one of my students at the Melbourne Writers Festival for deathly dead, dying, dead female poets thing. Um, so it's a joy to see her in another incarnation. Hopefully she won't humiliate me in the same way. Ladies and gentlemen, Misha. <laughs> And finally, somebody who has been a, a, an extraordinary mover and shaker, a, a fixture of the artistic community for a long time, Juliana Engberg, who is the curator of ACCA and also the curator of the 2014 Sydney Biennial. Um, interesting this, because uh, one of the questions I would like to ask further down the line is what is the definition of artist in terms of a curatorial role? I think personally that trying to wrangle and find some coherence in an amorphous group of artists is in itself an art, though Juliana very um, diffidently said that she wasn't one. So we'll get to that further in the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Julia Engberg. So um, as is always the case when I'm doing a gig like this, I started off thinking, um, what, what's this all about, really? You know, what, what, is, what is it that we're here to discuss today? And I have spent a lot of time in my career, I suppose, agonizing about definitions of art and definitions of feminism. Um, one of the first things I, I used to do when I was persecuting first years um, in my university courses was ask them to identify themselves. What's your sense of identification? So I'd say, you know, who considers themselves to be Australian? Who's a Greek Australian? Who's gay? Who's straight? Who's a feminist? And who's a liberal? Most of the questions, with the exception of the last one, no, the penultimate one, most of the questions were uncontentious. You know, students would think, oh, yeah, okay, I'm a liberal, heterosexual, Greek, Australian, yes, okay. Yeah. Ask the feminist question, and there would be a deathly silence. Occasionally, a really cool bloke would put his hand up and say, hey, I'm a feminist, yeah. But the women, to a woman, no, nothing from them. And these were 18-year-old girls, and I'd say to them, what, 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 why? Why are you not saying that you're a feminist? Without feminism, you wouldn't be here. There would be no education for you. There'd be no university for you. 
And I remember Rebecca Hargreaves, she said to me, I don't want anyone to accuse me of being a hairy-legged lesbian. At which point, of course, I put my leg on the desk and I rolled up my trouser leg and I said, what, like this, like this. And after that, they realised that that there was an issue of sexuality and depilation that really couldn't be taken away from, from feminism. I did once actually do an entire unit at at university as an undergrad on depilation, which was, it was taught by a woman called Mary Beard. You like that? (laughs) It's true. Anyway, um, right, now we've warmed the room up. Um, So I I think we should start off by actually asking this esteemed panel your definitions of feminism and art. I think that because women have been so excluded from the art world because of structural inequality, that we actually have to expand the definition of art in order to include them. So that's my position, that things like the prepared environment of the classroom, looking after children, all these things that um, women do can be put inside art if we expand it. That's a very interesting... Do you, do you think there's a danger of, of then um, just creating a just female art? Art that's about prams in the hallway? No. No, I don't think so at all. I think it's a really exciting possibility. And it's a lateral possibility. We just have to look at it differently. OK, that's very interesting. We'll come back to that, because the idea of lateral versus linear in terms of definition is something that, that is really... Um, it's a fascinating thing to uh, explicate and try to get to the bottom of. Atlanta, what about you? Oh, well, we're going in order. <laughs> oh, why not? <laughs> Let's be linear for a while. Uh, a definition of feminism, for me, I, don't, I think it doesn't have one. Like, by nature, it's a forward-looking process. It's reinventing itself all the time, so... Um, and it's always been, um, I mean, it's, it's existed in a multitude of contexts um, and has never shared like a consens- consensus sort of defining what it is and what it does. Um, so I think, yeah, by nature, it doesn't, it ha- doesn't have a definition. It's like something that's perpetuating itself and reinventing itself all the time to be, I mean, to operate as something relevant now. Do you have a personal definition? Uh, I think it's, I mean, I think maybe it's a practice or mm. that I am a feminist, but I don't think... No, I don't, I don't have a definition for myself. It's just kind of what I am. It's a part of, you know, my identity. I've decided now that we have to go for the synchronic lava lamp approach. Consequently, I'm going for Juliana rather than oh. <laughs> Change of plan. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, gosh. OK. Um, well, being an older person than some of the other panellists, I think for, for me feminism has changed a little bit over time. Um, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the first phase of it when it was discussed broadly as a, a phenomenon and a revolution uh, and something that was going to change things. And I suppose in a, in a personal kind of way for me that meant I thought my mother should go out to work and should not, you know, be... Um, jailed in, you know, a desperately sad domestic space in a horrible out suburb and feel sort of disappointed with herself. Um, gradually, of course, the nuances start to impinge upon you as you grow up yourself and as other things come into the picture. And for me, I suppose, feminism has always been linked solidly to humanism. I think it's one of the um, avant-garde movements that brought attention to and continues to do so, I hope, uh, to the, the plight of many people who are disadvantaged, uh, who operate in the minority, uh, even though they may be, you know, um, quite clearly a majority of, of people. So for me, it's always been something that's attached to a, a broader concept of, you know, humanism and, and the right to achieve what you wish to achieve, the right to be the best that you can be, um, not, not held back or prevented from doing that simply because of your gender or indeed your race or indeed your ethnicity, etc., or your beliefs and so forth. So uh, to me, it is a very broad kind of definition um, and it's transited for quite a period of time. And, and I think it goes in waves. I, I, I totally agree. In some ways, it, it evolves and changes all of the time. Thank you. Mish? Um, 
I think I agree with what has been said. Um, I guess for me personally, though, there's a kind of thing that, like, maybe on a good day, I would say I define it as um, saying that, like, gender doesn't have to define you or guide you, if I had to put it into a sentence. And on a bad day, I'd probably say, like, oh, all men are actually fuckwits. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go with that and go through life, then you kind of accept and move on. <laughs> I, I think that's a positive spin. I like to think about that one. Um, but what you just said, though, that raises an interesting issue about whether there is an essentialism or a performativity to this. You know, do we... Do, when a woman creates art, is it essentially female art, essentially feminist art? Is there a difference between it? Or is it just, in inverted commas, art that happens to be created by a woman? And have you found in your own practices that there's been a desire to categorise you and define you by your gender? That's, that's not in the line. Just throw in the answers. There is, I think... Well, I've, actually, I noticed with, the, with my students, they don't understand why a show that's got heaps of women in it is a feminist show, whereas a show that's got heaps of men in it is just a normal show. <laughs> Say it's got 60 70% men. Why is that? And, you know, a lot of the things that are uh, discussed in the artwork are very masculine. Why is that a kind of normative situation? Um, and so this idea of feminism brings up those, those contradictions. And perhaps that's the problem with these kind of big survey shows that are feminist, in a way. Is, is that difficult for them to, uh, to feel a sense of entitlement to, to critique? I think they just see it as illogical. They don't understand it. So for them, it's such a norm that there, should, that there shouldn't be gender differentiation that they can't understand why there would be a purely female show. Mm. Mm. When, what do you say to them when, <laughs> when they argue that? I think that with the definitions, you just take it, take what you need and adapt it. Mm. We, sh we should use them as we need them, as we wish it should be up to us. If feminism is useful, we should use that term. If it's not... It's, it's not necessary. That's what I think. But people often put those things onto you as well. Like, they, they, mm. if you're an artist, you're a female artist or you're a female performance group as opposed to just, like, a neutral performance group because you are other, the, the otherness of being 50% of the population. Yeah, it actually <laughs> comes up as a category. There are these kind of websites that rate artists and being a woman artist actually comes up as a category, a kind of trait or is it doesn't for men, male yeah. artists? Mm -hmm. So that's something that might affect the value of your work, so it's important. And it's interesting too, thinking about, um, from the Sydney perspective, um, when Belvoir Theatre's 2015 season was announced, uh, certainly in the age, I presume it was the same in the Sydney Herald, um, there was the, the, the headline was saying, Belvoir 2015 feminist season. Mm. Well. Yes, admittedly, we're doing a radical deconstruction of the Wizard of Oz, and I might be doing naughty <laughs> things to Toto, I don't know. <laughs> I've not been told yet. I quite fancy being the lion. But, um, you know, it just... It's it, it just uh, unlike the previous history of that theatre, suddenly there are women working there. And what, does that necessarily make it a feminist thing? Mm. Because you have women working there. I'm not sure whether it's actually something that's used in a disparaging term. Have you, have you found that? Um, at Belvoir particularly, well, or...? No, uh, generally in your practice, and, and across the board. Yeah, go on. Well, I think in, in the case of Belvoir, it's, a, you know, it's specifically in response to the last you know, 10 years and Ralph coming in, what's happened there, and the way that the representation of female artists in key creative roles has totally shifted. Like, the, the number has shifted, the percentages have shifted. So I think that that headline is, for, you know, is, is, re is referencing that. Is trying to create a new story, though. Perhaps, yeah. But I, and, and, then, then, and then there's the question of, like, is it, doing it, is it doing the work a disservice, you know? Like, or are these big shows that are, like, feminist shows and they're called that or they're called, like, a survey of women's work, is that useful in, in like, constantly reinforcing ourselves as the other? Because I'm not sure that it is, personally. I think it can be... Like, it, on the one hand, it does support and encourage and, you know, grow the work. On the other hand, it just keeps saying, yeah, but it's not, it's not, the, it's, it's, it's not, that, it's not the other stuff that you're used to or mm. something like that mm. for the viewer or the reader. And, and when you're curating, 
do you feel that it's, I suppose it's that constant battle between um, giving people an opportunity who have been marginalised and also not wanting to, dare I say, ghettoise the group? I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I think from a very early stage in my curatorial work, I've been gender blind. I, I just don't really think about it. Mm -hmm. And occasionally it's pointed out to me that maybe a year has had more female artists in it than male artists, and that another year may have had more male artists than female artists. But it generally tends to become rather equivalent. And, I, you know, for instance, with the Biennale, I never, I never bothered to count it, but someone came up to me with very excited and said, oh, I think you are the first person to have put so many female artists into a Biennale. And it's like, well, whatever. Um, I mean, I'm just not that interested in that. But I think that there has been great value in uh, some of the more historical work that some of my colleagues have done, Connie Butler's WAC, which was a very, you know, large survey of um, the tendency of feminist practice. Uh, and, you know, it's good to look upon those things and to understand historically where they're placed, where they've come from and what they lead to, and that's the reason to do that kind of work. I myself would probably not embark on a show as I did, you know, in 1986 or something called Feminist Narratives because that's no longer especially interesting to me. But I do think that, you know, and this is to go to a question that I think you, you posed earlier, I think there are some interesting aesthetics that do emerge out of um, the practice of women. Um, there is the body, I think, that often is, is there, and not necessarily in an essentialist way, uh, but there is a kind of vocabulary that comes from the body, and it's often explored, and if you go back historically, it's always been explored, and it may be perhaps because it's the material available to, to women. Uh, even when they're painting, perhaps they're painting their own body, uh, you know, because that is the body that's available to them and they're not a male artist who can go out and get a prostitute or something of this sort. Um, you know, so these things I think are very interesting to think about. And, you know, it, it's, uh, we have a variety of practice. Some of it's historical, some of it's more contemporary, some of it lives in between. It might be more thematically organised or surveyed. And so I think one wouldn't be absolute about putting it out or, or leaving it in. I think um, times require certain uh, observations and I think part of the work of curating is to make these observations if you can. Mm. Sorry, I've been a bit of mm. rambled off. No, thought. no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, that raises a, 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 one of the, I think, really fascinating things about the aesthetic. And I, I'm, I'm curious, actually, whether it's a female aesthetic or a feminist aesthetic of how women deal with the body in their art form, be it... Uh, performance-based art or, or be it more visual or um, installation art, actually how the body operates and whether it operates in a way that is very different because of female experience. And one would think that that's, that's obvious because of the subjectivity implicit in creation. But when that's presented to an audience and when it's received by an audience, what do you think are the different messages that come across from the female use of the female body? I suppose I'm looking at you because your, your use yeah. of your body and your work is so extraordinary. Well, the body is the work, so I don't like, have... Like, that's the tool in which I'm working with. Um, and I guess the first sort of uh, major work that I made was the content of it was very much in conversation with um, artists that had been referred to as feminists, not necessarily by themselves, but just through their institutionalisation. So... Um, because the content of the work was, um, yeah, in conversation or expanding or questioning um, feminist artists, I guess then the framing of the work was something that I was particularly interested in, um, in transferring, uh, in sort of like um, using in a sort of contemporary feminist agenda, I guess. So... Would, would you be able to describe a little bit what um, you're doing? Yeah, it seems quite a long time ago. I'm having d difficulty articulating it because I feel like... We can perform it if you can. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the content of my work is um, feminist anyway. So, you know, this, this particular work was explicitly talking about feminism, but the framing of it was... That was where my interest was in establishing new kind of, kinds of relationships in which to be in the theatre, for example. As the um, audience entered, I was hula-hooping naked up on a plinth and the lights were on. So I could see the people as much as they could see me. Um, and I was 
uh, speaking to a feminism that is without activism, which is what we can see in popular culture, Beyonce, for example. So I did a Beyonce choreography, but in a um, you know black sack over my head, wearing Nikes and completely naked. So that it was sort of like this juxtaposition of a feminist performance art reference with contemporary culture to, to sort of produce a, like a perversion or a new association for the image or the sound. Um, but really working on the frame of the theatre and producing another kind of way of being together in that space. If I was smarter, maybe I would have charged the male audience members more to buy a ticket to come than the female. Like, if, if I'm trying to think about, like, talking about feminism in the content of the work and in the aesthetics is one thing, but then how does work operate in the world as a feminist object, which isn't much exclusive to a female artist or a male artist. It's like what is the, the um, like the incentive, or the, like what do we want to change and how do you do it in a practical sense, in a structural sense, thinking as a feminist but not necessarily talking about aesthetics like recognising the grotesque female image or um, yeah, using bodily fluid. Not that this, those kinds of works and those kinds of references aren't super beautiful and interesting and powerful, um, but yeah, it's, just a, it's different, I guess, because I didn't say before what I think art is and I also don't know what art is, but I'm wondering about what my responsibility is as an artist mm -hmm. and as a feminist and how that is recognisable as an aesthetic because that's when it produces nothing. Well, it's an interesting point that, that you know, when you said about the potential for charging men extra, um, I, uh, I do wonder about this issue of, of whether there's a potential for for art to change and for feminist art to affect a change. Uh, and I'm not very sanguine about it, I have to say, because in my own work, um, and I, actually when I've been starkers too on stage, there's a sense of, um, I found a sense of not being able to convey the, um, the message without the frame of a naked middle-aged woman. And that, that can raise some interesting questions. Uh, earlier this year, I was in a production of Frankenstein where um, I was naked apart from 29 sort of Patricia Pacini um, tits attached to me <laughs> in 5,000 water balloons for an hour and a half. And my students came along to that. And this was the rabble, so it was a very... Um, uh, it was a, a female and a feminist aesthetic at the same time. And the... The, the women students took to this very, uh, they were very taken by its messages about motherhood and about uh, abortion and were confused, but confused in a, in a good way, I think. Most of the male students just distanced themselves and said, well, this isn't for us because we don't really understand about motherhood and we don't understand about abortion or pregnancy. And I'm looking at my lecturer naked with 29 bosoms on. And so that, that distance, actually, of the gendered distance was quite a shock to me as a teacher, thinking we've we failed. We've not been able to, to itch the brain in the right way to make this audience interrogate what we're trying to say because they're seeing it as a, as a gender divide, because the subject, because the bodies. So for you and your practice, I'm curious as to whether you think there is a way that we can actually use feminist art as a tool for change rather than to um, cement and solidify gender definitions. Before we go to that, though, I just like I think it's a really interesting um, point that you you brought up about charging males and females differently, and and I have a I have a bit of a problem with it only in as much as I think what you're suggesting is that the male male audience would be more voyeuristic and get something more from it than a female, and that's that would be to deny that females can also be voyeurs mm. and that they can also take pleasure from the gaze, and so that that's an interesting idea that you have that somehow the gaze of the male is, you know, more powerful or, or objectifying to you. And I, I'm, I'd be cautious about that. No, but at, I, that's not what honest. I meant, because I was talking about the economy. Well, why would you charge them more then? Because it, statistically men get paid more than women. Like, oh, that's what I I'm see. Oh, it's Just an like economic how, argument. Okay. How to, like, okay. mirror or, or have some agency in the real economy of the situation. Okay, to be if it's an economic a thing, I can, on I can guess I can the go there. And as a performer, the amount you charge to view the performance is your economy. So if yeah. you uh, mess with it or experiment with it, you, can, you potentially create a new economy. 
I mean, for us as artists, we have the tangible result of our work, which we may then sell, even though that's just one way and it's changing mm. so much anyway. But I think the more you experiment with that economy, the more you are able to invent new forms. Is that, is that a gender decision to play with, with the economy? Was it actually a, a far greater, a macro social decision? Isn't Sarah Silverman doing some like possible campaign to raise $70 billion to close the pay gap in America? <laughs> I think at the moment. I think I saw something. She, yeah, there's like a, like a, it's a pretty funny video that she made and she's like, we just got to raise the money to pay off the debt. So let's raise $70 billion. She should try potato salad. Or something like that. Hey? Do you see the potato salad possible? Yeah. Oh, oh, no. Distressing. But do you mean she's trying to close the pay gap between women and men? I think it's a, it's a kind of provocative action. Okay. Um, well, what what to... happens about the Hispanics and the, the blacks and the people of colour in generally who get even less money than women? Yeah, but she's a woman. She's speaking for herself. I guess yeah. she can't speak for other people. No, but, you know, there's... Looking back at the film that <laughs> Josephine said, I did think that there was this... Um, rather privileged kind of position that was uh, there in, in the 70s of these white women who, you know, mm. had a certain kind of privileged status at any rate and there was a, a kind of exclusivity of uh, other issues that could have been um, taken up at that time. I mean, certainly someone like Adrienne Piper um, was someone who bridged that gap um, fairly fundamentally in an art practice. But, you know, there's... We, we, we mustn't, I think, go go back to a situation... Well, I would prefer not to go back to a more binary situation, mm. to, be, to be honest with you. And I don't think it's necessarily very uh, helpful. And looking back, they seem to be saying we should have identified more with lack in yeah. society rather than saying, why don't we have what equal pay or why don't we have more opportunities? And this, of course, is when things started to separate between the essentialists who were more binary... Yeah. And then, you know, people who actually started to be interested more in some of the theoretical propositions around other, which then actually brought others into the other context. And, and you know, this is why I think feminism has been a very useful platform to enlarge our scope of discussion. Uh, and that, that's why I would be a little disappointed if we just go back to a sort of more binary us and them uh, situation. But I, I think it can be both. Like, I think that there is... You know, like, you know, there is obviously, like, a massive Venn diagram between, like, queer politics or queer um, conversations and feminisms. But I think that, like, when a woman says, I'm a woman and this is what I think about being a woman, I don't think that she's, like, letting things down because she's not allowing... She's not blurring that... Bi like, she's not um, actively blurring that binary, you know? Like, and I think that... I think that also the kind of argument that, um, you know the privileged white woman argument is a really good one and it's an ongoing criticism of feminism but it's I think it's also the thing that you have to just keep acknowledging and acknowledging the privilege that you carry but then you have to just keep going and talking about it anyway because that's that's yeah no like, you do fuck. of course and it can and the same can be said about men you know white privileged men who also make lots of the decisions of the world etc which yeah. should be called to task all of the time but I you know I, I think we've gone through a number of phases now and it's become um, broadly more sophisticated and I think we want to make a powerful use of that sophistication. But when uh, you, s you speak of sophistication, um, it's interesting that at the same time that we have post-structuralism and we have post-dramatic theory, we also have post-feminism, which seems one of the more retrograde and reductive ways of... And we've got... I think we've got new feminism, and I think we might be going into a hyper-feminism sort of phase oh, as well, awesome. which is kind of, you know, really <laughs> sort of interesting. And if visceral is coming back into practice... Sorry, vis you, you the vis vis visceral? Yeah, the visceral was pushed out a little bit from about the 90s onwards. It was, you know, de classe for a little bit. Seems to me to be coming a little bit back into the fold. Now, that will be done with a, with a great history of knowledge attached to it, so, you know, you can't, you can't just do a Judy Chicago now without sort of knowing the history of that and what it carries. So if we're going into hyper-viscerality, which I suspect one of the things that will be happening just at the moment, just as we're going into a kind of hyper-collectivity and a hyper, you know, multiplicity of practice and more um, collective endeavours and things like this, 
This comes with a, a lot of history attached to it, uh, and that's why it's much more sophisticated. It can never be as naive and as simplistic as it was before. Um, so it's kind of exciting, really. So if your practice like is you're very visceral, Atlanta's for instance, work. you know yeah. that's that's a, that's a next phase, you know, which is exciting to think about. And I think the multitude is really good for women artists. Yes, who've made themselves indispensable by doing all sorts of different <laughs> things, so they can come on board, but they won't be paid like an apex male artist. No, it probably is, still not. It is an exciting time, yeah. though. Lots of people are going to be able to come back yeah. in. Not so much in Australia, where I think we've mm. done a very good job of keeping it very equivalent, actually. Uh, and, you know, speaking in Australia is very different from, say, speaking in other parts of the world, too, where I think from the 70s onwards, women had, you know, have had a very strong position in a number of ways in the art world. Mm. Uh, I'm not, I don't know about the theatre world or, or whatever, but in the visual art world... They've had um, quite a strong position, and I think equi equivalence and equality has been maintained by a lot of those people being, you know, in positions of some influence and some decision-making power too. Mm -hmm. Not at the state gallery system, uh, I hasten to add. But do you feel it cyclical? Because I'm, I'm concerned. I remember four years ago, sitting in the audience here for um, a panel called Drama Queens. Did anyone here attend that? It was with... Uh, uh, Patricia Cornelius and Chris Mead and uh, Marion Potts and Ralph Myers and it was uh, and Van Badham and it was heartbreaking absolutely heartbreaking because it was publishing the stats of uh, how many women playwrights were developed won awards and then the stats of how many went on to have their work produced and I was thinking it's, it's in four years the, the cultural atmosphere in theatre has changed beyond recognition absolutely beyond recognition, um, for which, frankly, as somebody who, who gets work, I'm, I'm kind of grateful. But it's also cyclical. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that, give it a few more years, we'll go right back to the way we were, which is exactly what happened in the UK. Mish, what do you think? Do you think there's, there's going to be change? or? Um, I think there is always change. Yeah, I think things that are cyclical, I would agree. But I also think that that, that particular shift came out of the industry holding the major... Uh, you know, I don't know, stakeholders or made it major holders of resources accountable for their decisions and for speaking up against what those decisions reflected in terms of value. And so I think that the only thing that you can do as a maker is to keep holding those centres of power accountable. Sure. How do you do that? You say, what the fuck, Belvoir? There's no women. <laughs> and then you get your friends to say the same thing and then they're like, oh, maybe we should put some women on. <laughs> but it's also maybe being an, ad an advocate for another kind of discourse rather mm -hmm. than one that looks backwards because that's what we tend to do and then we do consolidate this possibility for a cycle. So I don't know like how to speak to feminism without speaking backwards, um, you know, which is somehow controversial, I guess. I don't know. Without, no, because like, it has a history. And, uh, and you, yeah. you, you must know a history in order to actually progress from the history or to not repeat a bad part of the history. But I mean, it that's, didn't have that's one history. Like it, it had it many. Like, yeah, and it still does and exists in kind of different fashions in different places. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just a thought, like how not to, yeah, produce the same again, wouldn't it be to kind of escape some sort of recognisable territory in terms of like, um, yeah. I mean, when we're making art or performance or whatever, that's like a, a, a reference or a, yeah, I don't know. How to um, do something we don't yet know how to like talk about in terms of the discourse, in terms of an ideology. How do you have like a non-ideological feminism, like one that's Imaginative. But why, I don't know why you would. I, don't, I can't see it as possible to have a non-ideological feminism because it's ipso facto it is a, a kind of form of ideology if you, if you think of it as a feminism, if you're, if you're conscious about it. If you're acknowledging the movements yeah. from the past. Yeah, but if it's functioning today, like how is an ideological positioning serving me that's working in like this multitude and like yeah I don't know if it's so um, to define it in such a way that is, that is um, post or new or mm. you know is it's, that can it's it not just assimilated into you in a way 
Because I'm wondering when we're talking about uh, uh, the when we're talking about binaries and also when we're talking about the linearity of history, which is obviously a construct too, in a way that that raises some issues that that you might have found Emily with the teaching too and in the academy, where we have a structure of knowledge and an epistemology which is very much based on dualities, on binaries, on this idea of straight rigor and logic. Um, and the female aesthetic can be something which is quite different, which can rub up against it, which can work through it, which can explo explode it as well as explore it. Um, so I'm wondering whether this issue of articulating is actually because we're tied into a logocentricity, we're tied into language in a way that doesn't actually serve our purpose, because your body speaks rather than your words, doesn't it? But I guess the question is, where do you go with your body? I mean, if, you know, do you do an Orlon? Do you do a Abramovich? How far can you go with your body that hasn't been done already and not hurt yourself? Or are you speaking... I wonder if I hear from what you're saying something about... Um, such, like, a similar thing of, like, not wanting to be tied into words or, or definitions, but maybe also wanting to look for a newness, like a new way of a new way of being feminist or something, or a new expression or a kind of like, um, yeah, trying to, f yeah, yeah. Is that yeah, I'm just trying to think how, if it's useful and how um, it's been a hindrance and also been beneficial. Um, identifying my work and myself with uh, an a historical feminism and then thinking about, yeah, how can it now, you know, exist outside of that, um, yeah, like a, a definitive, recognisable position. Rather, that use, use it to produce other things, you know, outside of a female aesthetic. Like, I don't know that there is one. <laughs> or a feminist aesthetic. I mean, I know that people talk about other people's work, especially um, curators or critics or, people or institutions that need to organise artworks. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't see what a female... I don't know what a female aesthetic is. I don't think, I don't think it really exists. I think people make oh, work and then... Yeah. yeah. No, I, mean, I, I see, I, I think that there is, but, you know, there's always a danger of saying so mm. uh, because you, you can trap people You just trap consolidate people it. You just make it that. so. But I think un so. undeniably there are certain things that actually are held within the, femin the feminine aesthetic. There is a kind of um, aqueous sublime, for instance, mm -hmm. that is often there. Uh, there is a, a preponderance of hair. Uh, there, <laughs> hair is always there in some way or another. It's quite weird. Uh, you know, there, there are cyclical shapes. There are all sorts of things like that. And I don't mean in the essentialist way. They, they creep in in sort of circuitous ways. They're, they lurk in practice. If you look at someone like Pippolotti Wrist, she is absolutely um, looking at a feminine aesthetic and quite deliberately so. She would all, also call herself a feminist, uh, but she would hope that that would be, you know, delivered uni universally in some sort of ways. But undeniably, she is using feminine language and it's quite deliberate and it's, it's intentionally provocative because it's almost too pretty, it's almost too joyful, it's almost too excessive. It's like a gush. Uh, and that, of course, you know, lo is located within the possibility of the vagina. So, you know, it does go back to that. But she wouldn't sit here and kind of talk about herself as an essentialist at all, but it is in the practice. Yeah. And, it's, and it lurks, I think, sometimes in surrealism as well. And it's one of the reasons why surrealism continues to be, I think, aesthetically a force for a lot of artists who are women. Uh, there's a language that can be um, extrapolated from it and taken from it and used. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, what some of the earlier feminist work did, you know, it, it looked at a kind of more surreal proposition, a more Baroque kind of um, uh, aesthetic, which, of course, was located within the body. Um, Judy Chicago, who first of all started doing extremely good, very taut, uh, minimalist sculptures in the form of, say, Robert Morris, who, you know, went flippo and went to uh, the vagina quite quickly with the dinner party. <laughs> um, you know, sort of lost her mojo with, you know, the male art thing to explore some 
other kind of aesthetic which mm. she carried through. I, I, you know, there is a feminine aesthetic. It's not always a feminist aesthetic. And I don't think we can always collapse the two together. No, no but what's coming across from what you're saying about the female aesthetic is subversion. Yeah, it is very subversive and, and um, I think that that's its power. Uh, in some ways, and that's why it's often r rather scary for people to encounter, whether it be joyous or not, whether it be visceral or abject or all of those sorts of things. There is a great power in the in the female body, uh, and you know we have mysteries that men can never really understand, such as you know birthing and things of this sort, which are um, make us very sort of terrifying in a lot of ways. So uh, I think a lot of Women artists, you know, over time have used some of those things. But equally, there are many, many artists now who are female who, you know, eschew that. And during the 90s and the, the thousands, uh, I think there was a, a very deliberate movement away from anything that could be seen to be, you know, located within that essentialism. Mm -hmm. So that we could gain some space in the art world, uh, you know, on a different set of platforms and terms. So if you ask someone like Barbara Kruger, you know, is she a feminist artist? She'll say, you know, which feminism? There are many of them. Uh, you know, she, of course she's a feminist, but she doesn't consider herself as providing a platform for that discussion in her art. She's more interested in the issues of humanity, mm -hmm. and she's more is interested in the way in which, as a female, she participates in humanity, looking at power, knowledge, mm -hmm. um, money, you know, all of those things which burden all of us. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Hey, Emily, what, what about your practice? <laughs> I... I think that I come to feminism from a position of learning and almost reenactment of those uh, 1970s gestures. So by repeating them, I think you can make them new. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I've looked at um, the feminist activism that my mum did during the 70s and the 80s. And what was it like from my point of view as a child being part of that uh, and trying to just provide a different perspective mm. by doing that. Um, and also, rather than having a kind of Marxist concept of those times, to actually think about what it might be to actually commodify them, to breathe this kind of exciting life into them and make them wantable, to make feminism something that's really... Um, I don't know, fashionable, exciting. That would be nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah, like a like a commodity in itself. But have you heard Beyonce's new album? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is true. It's happening, yeah. <laughs> but it's also, I mean, yeah, I think that's totally yeah. an interesting position, though, to, like, mm. work inside of that position to affect mm. change rather than um, removing yourself from it. And, rather yeah. than being yeah. the kind of police person yeah. Yeah. who's always looking for the commodity thing. But I think for, for my students, they are definitely coming from that position of learning. Mm. They're, they're reenacting all these things from that, that kind of feminist period of the 70s and the 80s. They're still concerned about, number one is probably measurement and commodification of their body. They're sick of it. So they'll get out the Barbie doll, they'll cut the head off, they'll make that <laughs> Every artwork. year, don't they? They do it every and year. <laughs> Exactly, every year. That's Sometimes fine. they pull it out of themselves. <laughs> you know, they'll quite good. stuff a pair Skills. of jeans, yeah. they'll make an installation with uh, scales in it, or they'll actually repeat uh, feminist performance that they haven't, without actually having seen it. Yes. And I think yeah. there's something really great about that. Yeah. Maybe feminism of that time is a pedagogy. Maybe actually by repeating the gestures, you learn something. And, and also something that, that I found, because similarly my students repeat the same things year after year yeah. without realising, um, something necessary, yeah. something cathartic. Perhaps. Rather than saying, oh, you should go and look at this, or of course you do have to say that. Um, and that film actually of, of tonight is fantastic in that way, something to recommend as a kind of expansive um, history as well. But yeah, what's wrong with doing it again? It's different because it's now. Well, we do Shakespeare. Again. That's right, reenactment. <laughs> but well, because we have a history, we have a content now. We actually do have a content. And, uh, you know, you have to feel sorry a little bit for the male painters who used to have content through the women's bodies mm. who are no longer to, available to them. That's probably one of the reasons why painting changed a great deal as, 
as well. And that exchange has actually you know, been quite influential from around 68 onwards too. But it is interesting that we have a content and that you know, if your students are repeating those things or investigating those issues anew, um, that's rather exciting, I think. Yeah. It could also be nostalgia. That's you the know, thing, and, that's and, my and, problem. And we do have to worry yeah, about that. that a little bit. There is a fashionability around some of those things and this, yeah. this uh, you know, emergence now of the collective performative uh, movement-based thing is a little couched, I think, in nostalgia yeah. too. Um, can be a little unknowing and removed from its original politics. And we so, possibly lose the opportunity to invent new forms mm. by hanging on. It's I true. Think. So it's all, you've always got to be thinking about But it's about little that. steps. Well, I, yeah. I think, Things shift yeah. a little bit each yeah. time. I yeah. think we should now see whether the audience has to invent new forms in their questions. Um, can I open up uh, the, the session to the audience then, please? We have some people with microphones wandering around. So... Who would like to kick us off with a question, a statement, comment? Um, I'm a photographer who uses her body in her work a lot, particularly in a grotesque sense. Um, uh, I think, I don't know, I've been really interested in the idea of uh, non-binary gender expression. Um, and I read an article recently that proposed quite radically. I've been asking people at dinner parties what they think of it and most people seem very um, uncomfortable with it. That the only way to move forward now is to abolish gender. To allow, like, if a, if a woman wants to present as masculine, she should have the th freedom to do that. Uh, if a man wants to wear a skirt, he should have the, f the freedom to do that. And I feel that that's still quite controversial. And I'd just like to know um, how, what you think about that. It, you know, is it, uh, if we blurred the lines between gender, is that a better situation for everyone? And does it give people the freedom to live with more authenticity and self-expression? Thank you. Who would like to take that one? Well, I think the short answer is yes, and that's already happening with lots of people. Um, I think that, like, well, that's what I, I kind of started... That's how I think about feminism, is that, like, you shouldn't be de defined by a gender, or, and that includes men as well, and includes, like, that there are more genders than, than just the binary of male and female. Um, so I think that... I think that that kind of theory... Uh, but I think that there's a danger in saying abolish g gender because for me it's like you don't have to be constrained by any particular definitions of what gender is, but at the same time... Um, the, um, at the same time, I think you can be a gender. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, like, that, that not, that there, not that it doesn't exist, but that it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I don't think you should feel guilty for that, personally. Like, that's all right. No, I think, I, think, <laughs> I, th I think we're at a point where, in fact, it's quite exciting. People are actually free to begin to say, I, I won't be linguistically defined. I won't uh, be constrained by um, normatives or, you know, some other person's concept of who I would be or where I live on a gender spectrum. And I think it's true what you say. It is already actually happening. We had a performance with Alicia Frankovich the other day, uh, which was uh, titled Def um, Defending Plurality, um, or Plural or something. And, and many of the performers were transgender. And uh, there does seem to me to be a, jo a very joyous sense of freedom around uh, this you know, opportunity to simply be oneself. And you know, we've really known this for a very long time in certain ways since... Kinsey and people like that did their groundbreaking studies that showed that there is no really such thing as, you know, this and this. It's, it's very much a blur in between. And I think, you know, I think people are getting a little bit more relaxed about that, actually. I see a lot of blokes in skirts now. And yeah. not just in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bev. One at the back. 
Um, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. My name's Simone. I um, work for a regional youth circus in Mullumbimby in Northern New South Wales Spaghetti Circus. So I work with a lot of young people. My particular concern, and with their bodies in circus and physical theatre, my particular concern is um, it seems that the n we, more so than ever we have the need for feminist action when it seems that the increase of women's bodies, the, the increase in the exploitation of women's bodies, I watch what my niece, I don't have children of my own, but I watch what my nieces and nephews watch at 6 a.m. in the morning and the whole, you know, our music videos. And I, I'm appalled and I feel like a conservative old nana. I turn it off. <laughs> um, and, and with the, you know, the three waves of feminism in, in the, you know, the, the 20th century, at the turn of the suffragettes and then again in the 20s and then in the 70s. I, 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 I wonder and I despair about... Uh, um, it, I think it's time for another wave and I wonder how that's going to happen and where it's going to happen. And, and then I think about the kinds of feminism that there are and, uh, and I note the uniformity of... Um, skin colour on the panel and, and I do note there is a difference between a white middle class feminism and a black working class feminism and a Muslim woman's um, idea of feminism and this is halfway between a comment and a question. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so I just wanted to unpack that and, 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 and wonder about you know, the support we can give each other in an increasingly conservative and sexist world. Thank you. Um, so, well, I suppose, first of all, we should say, is this the, the legacy of post-feminism, or is, has there always been this sort of sexism in the media? It's just we have more of it now. Mm. And what can we do about it, or should we do something about it? Well, the thing we can do is keep talking about it. That's very important. And I, I do sense, again, another wave coming through. I think a lot of young women are particularly sensitive to some of these things, and that's perhaps because... Uh, it's gone through a wave in which, you know, things have become uh, a little bit out of control and um, women have been subjected once more to the gaze, you know, un unacceptably, etc. But I think we have to just keep that discussion going and, and there's a role to play in uh, families, in schools, in the media, uh, in politics, of course, and, you know, in the workplace, naturally. But even taking that comment a little bit further. Women are in actual jeopardy at the minute. Uh, women's bodies are in jeopardy, again, as part of, you know, war collateral. Mm. Girls are, are in jeopardy. Uh, and so when this happens, you know, we, we need to actually rise up and start saying those things. It's not the, it's not the place, it is the place, of course, of the art world, but it's, it's not only our place. Mm. It's actually a societal conversation that needs to take place. Uh, because there, there is an awful lot of uh, stuff happening to women, girls, uh, that that really does, you know, frighten us. You know, we'll, we'll put women back, girls back, a very long distance. And so we, we have to be alert to it. We have to always keep it on the agenda all of the time, talking about it all of the time. And really the politicians have to, uh, and really the schools have to. But uh, I also think art galleries have to or something. Yeah, like, of course. Because... But but it's there, there's a danger that our stuff becomes a little esoteric, uh, to be truthful. And I think, you know, that I'd like to see a more thoroughgoing conversation in the media, yeah. um, to, be, to be honest, because by the time our stuff filters out, it, it's, it sort of dissipates because there's a strong push against it in other directions. You know, commercialism has a great uh, pact, you know, in some ways with keeping women in a certain place as certain types of consumers, as certain types of objects. Uh, so it's not just, you know... But it is interesting to think somewhere. about that now, I think, because there is a danger, like, in not supporting sex positivity, and there is, like, also this complication, which I think I struggle with as well, about, like, you know, like... Um, the Anaconda video is pretty intense. And so you watch that, but then she's a woman who's, in, who's making that. So she's kind of, or is she, the questions that come up are around like how she's using or is she the maker of like that action or is she still in relationship to a kind of male paradigm, you know, like, or is that okay? Or, you know, all those kind of questions. 
And then I sort of wonder also on the thing of another wave coming. I think that I, I would argue that the idea of a wave is kind of complicated now because there are so many, like, um, you know, it's so accepted that there are so many feminisms and it's so, it's so accepted that it's um, this kind of idea of multiplicity of meaning and existence. It, and I think that, that, that maybe the kind of wave idea is, like, actually very old-fashioned and male. It's like, you know, a big triangle... But I think, no, like, I'm, well, not, I'm not actually skilled. I, I don't see the in males it. leading it particularly, to be honest with you. Sorry, Atlanta. Atlanta. I don't, um, I'm not, I don't have the skills to be an activist necessarily. Like, I'm a choreographer. But I, I do think about the social and political agency in which I have is pro in producing a dance performance. So the content of the work can be explicitly political or not, but... Artwork is inherently political anyway, whether you're talking about or, or producing representations of a feminist kind of image or whether you're choosing to exhibit or perform in certain contexts. Um, so, yeah, I guess in terms of, like, affecting real change in the world with what I do, it's... I'm, I don't really feel qualified to talk about, like, you know, the state of affairs universally around... Um, the bu abuses against women, women um, but to think about how can my work um, structurally affect change or think about um, not just the content of the work but the, um, yeah, the way in which I contribute to culture and produce culture and are a reflection of culture and yeah, if that is in the mode of transmission from the artwork to the individual or if that is actually the way in which I situate work, um, the production of work, the conditions in which I work um, as well. So it's, yeah, I guess it's always that double-edged thing with art. It's like content and, um, yeah, the agency of the, the social, political change, the which great, is like... The great thing that art, art does, art. and that's, that's its intrinsic power and its use, is that it almost always knows a little bit ahead of time. It's, it's, it sort of feels uh, a little earlier than a lot of things. And so you don't need to be worry about being programmatic because what you do will come from its time and from the necessity of that time. I don't mean, again, in an essentialist way, but art is almost always just a little bit ahead of the sort of mainstream recognition of something. Uh, that's its power. That's its force. Uh, and that's why it's, you know, it evolves a little bit differently to the sort of mainstream event as well. Um, whatever you do at this time will actually be in response to the time. And so that's the, that's the great thing about it. We have time for one more quick question. Yes, down the front, please. Hello. Um, my name's Izzy. I'm a theatre maker and a writer. Um, I really enjoyed when you guys were talking about um, kind of looking back um, and all of that, that got very complicated, but it was very interesting. <laughs> um, and I was wondering, it's kind of more of a personal question, hopefully all of you have a bit of an answer to it, um, what the future looks like for you in terms of feminism and art and what that intersect might be. Great, thank you very much. Can we have quickish answers from all of you? <laughs> oh, look, I have to think. Have to think. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah. Really... The future, I don't know. I have to think. Okay. The future of feminism, do you say? Like, yeah. yeah. And like how that kind of intersects with art. Like you talked about it a little bit before and kind of, I guess you were talking about like trying to get out of boxes a yeah. bit and get beyond that. But I don't know, just wonder what that looks like. Yes. That's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, in terms of... Um, something that's not necessarily recognisable, like that would be the change. Um, some, so I guess if it was, yeah, outside of a reference or, you know, beyond, um, yeah, some sort of recognisable territory. I mean, you'd make work and then it produces what it looks like and if, yeah, you, you're sort of busy with those questions about those relationships and... Um, then that's what it produces. I don't know what it should look like, but something that we don't yet know how to speak to in a very kind of historical, ideological, nostalgic way. Just like... Thank you. Just like that. Can I... Say, I oh, yes. You thought, yes. I mean, can I say that it is the age of the audience? 
and that you guys have to want it, I think. Very interesting. That's a provocation for you all to get your subscriptions going. Mish? Um, I guess in terms of my own practice, I think it's just like, I, I hope that it, that like I just, I'm a person who happens to be a feminist and who I think about, you know, I will continue to learn about that and live that. But I would hope that projects are um, not defined by that or by me, but like that there's a dramaturgy to each project and that each decision within that project is makes sense because of that idea that I'm working with at that time. So I don't think that I can pin it down to a particular aesthetic or set of concerns because I don't know what they are yet. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Juliana. Well, I hope for a future that's strong for all of us, um, as well as women being in a precarious position at the moment. I think the arts are in a precarious position too. And there's a lot of shift in the environment that will mean that we have to become very resourceful again for a period of time. Uh, and we will have to have great resolve to actually get through this period, uh, a period in which, you know, a lot of the arts are becoming privatised, controlled by um, others who, you know, don't share necessarily our social agenda. Um, it's notoriously difficult to shift a paradigm. It hardly ever happens. So I hope at least that as we plough along the trajectory, that we do it with uh, good spirit and force, that we're respectful of the past so that we don't... Uh, ignore it or, or deny it, uh, but that we build upon that and that we, we learn from those things and we enhance our knowledge as we go. I think uh, that's, that's the future I'd like to see and I hope it will culminate in something uh, pretty much like this discussion in another year or so's time when we've actually acknowledged that other things have happened. Thank you very much. And with that leap into the unknown, um, I'll bring to the end this session on feminism and art. Could you please join with me in thanking Juliana Egberg, Mish Grigger, Atlanta Eek, and Emily Floyd. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>